<laughs> of course we did. <laughs> we don't need those. We can just hear the ruins of Bethlehem, I promise. <laughs> just imagine what they would have looked like. I can, I'm controlling it through my phone, but it has never been a problem before. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to grab the other clicker just in case it goes out. Because <laughs> that would be amazing. It's gone, DJ. How are you? Doing good. I don't remember. The other clicker is usually in this drawer. <laughs> Shanna? Have a good cookie. Those are good. Well, there it is. It's slid under the. Well, I need to plug in this bit. We won't use it in, unless we need it. It's happening. <laughs> All right, how is everybody? We are uh, session eight now. And so we're finishing up from Babylon to Bethlehem, and the next time we'll get into the life of Christ. And so uh, let's pray before we jump in. Father, Lord, I thank you. Uh, so much for your kindness to us, for your mercies to us, for the ways that you chase us. Your patience with us is relentless, and you are just so good, so much better than anything that this world has to offer. Lord, I pray that you would become the one thing we seek, the one thing we desire above all else, because it's then that we sense your attributes and the fruit of your spirit in full measure. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us faith, give us a heart of obedience, overwhelm us with your presence. And Lord, tonight as we talk about the history of your people and your faithfulness to them, Lord, I pray that this would lead our hearts to worship. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so session eight, we're going from Babylon to Bethlehem. But one of the things I've, I've talked with you about is pretty regularly, probably once every two or three weeks, I like to go and, and search through any headlines of new discoveries that they're finding to see what's out there. And uh, in the past week or two, they've actually found something that's pretty phenomenal. And so if we went back to like our third class, we were talking about the days of Moses, fourth class, I guess. The days of Moses, and one of the things that they argue about is when Moses came and whether or not the Israelites were in, uh, in Israel, how all that came about. And you have the conservative position that says, no, 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 the Israelites came into the promised land around 1400 BC. If you were with us, you remember that debate? And people are all over the place on it. Well, they just found something that's really pretty fascinating and I want you to think what this evidence means, because it's just another brick in the house that's coming and saying, you know what, the Bible had it right all along, and all the people that jumped ship and tried to give explanations explaining the Bible away are actually having to walk back and say, you know what, it looks like they had it right all, the, all along. At the end of Moses' life, he gives a final series of, of sermons, and this is the book of Deuteronomy, it's captured in there. And one of the things that he's instructing Joshua and the people is he says, okay, I'm not allowed to go into the promised land. Moses looks at the promised land from Mount Nebo, but he tells Joshua, you're going to be the one that leads the people in. And he says, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land that you're entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings of God. So six tribes go to Mount Gerizim. And then he says, I want you to take the other six tribes 
And they're to go to Mount Ebal, and there you're to pronounce and proclaim the curses. In other words, if you follow the law of God and his will, these are the blessings that are associated with that. If you abandon the law and the will of God, then on Mount Ebal, they're going to be up there announcing the curses that go along with that. Well, one of the things that they found, which this is a fascinating stuff, is if you go to Mount Ebal, this is what it looks like from a distance. Shechem is situated right in between these two mountain ranges. On the left-hand side, you see Mount Gerizim, and this is going to be where you have all the blessings. Mount Ebal is where you see the curses, and one of the reasons for that is in the ancient world, Mount Gerizim was very green. It had a lot of vegetation on it, and Mount Ebal was rocks and dirt and sand, and it had no life. And so one was blessing and one was cursing, and it even looked that way. And even still to this day, if you look really closely, you can see that this is a little bit greener than this. This has kind of a brownish tone. And Shechem is situated right in between. Well, when they were excavating Ebal, they found Joshua's altar, if you remember. Well, they also recently uncovered when they get rid of debris, they, get, they, they send it off. And then they sift through it again, spraying water over it to see if anything separates out from that. And one of the things they found was a tablet, a lead tablet. And so Scott Stripling, who's leading the excavation of Mount Ebal, finds this lead tablet. And he says, I believe the amulet dates to the late Bronze II age or as early as 1400 BC. Some have dated it even earlier. So there you go again with a 1400 BC date. And he says this is earlier than many skeptics believe the Bible even existed. Okay, so what's special about this tablet? Anything? Well, there it is. I showed this to Pastor Ryan and he says it looks like a Pop-Tart. Like, you know, what's special about this? Well, what they would do in the ancient world is you would take lead plating, you would write on the inside of it, and then you would fold it in. And then as the lead cools, because you write on it when it's warm and you, you use an iron instrument and you carve into it, and then you fold it, and as it hardens, it becomes brittle and it will stay that way, right? Well, this is what it looks like from both sides and fold it over. And you can see, as you're looking at it, this is where you can see the fold, where this was folded together. And on this, like Job talks about writing into lead with an iron pen, which is just interesting. But what's fascinating, remember this is found on Mount Ebal. What are the contents of this lead tablet that date to 1400 BC that was found in the ruins of Joshua's altar? This is what it says. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by the God Yahweh, you will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die, cursed by Yahweh, cursed, cursed, cursed. It's an upper, right? Like this, this is a good news tablet, right? <clears throat> it's, a, it's been called the cursed tablet. What's, what's pretty amazing about that? What were they supposed to do on top of Mount Ebal? They were to announce the curses that were going to fall upon you if they abandoned the law of God. How many times does it say cursed? One, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you think of any reason why it might say that ten times? That's the covenant of the law. You obey the law or you're cursed. And one of the other things that they're blown away by is the style that it's written in follows absolutely the biblical pattern of the way things were written. And it's called chiastic. So you notice A at the end. A prime matches the beginning. And so that folds in into the middle. Cursed by the God Yahweh, cursed by Yahweh. You will die cursed, cursed you will surely die. And so they echo each other, meeting in the middle. It's called a chiastic structure. It's all over the Bible. It's all over the writings of Moses. And even this tablet exhibits the very same style that you find throughout ancient Israelite writing. And you want to know what's crazy is this tablet is that thing. Very small. Surprised you, didn't it? All of that writing on like a piece of shredded wheat looking thing, you know? Very small. And so what does this guy say? And it's gone and been tested in all these labs all over the world. 
because they have to do certain kinds of spectrometry or whatever it's called to where they scan inside this lead tablet so you can read it from the inside and they have to decipher it. It's really incredibly high tech. And when they got the results, it blew everyone away. And so the lead archaeologist on this says one can no longer argue with a straight face that the biblical text was not written until the Persian period. Remember the argument of the skeptics is, oh, they invented all the stories of the Bible after the exile to give Israel a history. He says you can't argue that with a straight face or the Hellenistic period as many higher critics have done. When here we do clearly have the ability to write the entire text at a much, much earlier date. What does he mean? We have Hebrew writing. This is proto-Hebrew. So that existed around 1400 BC. It's way earlier than what people had earlier estimated, which means the Hebrew culture had begun forming way before the enlightened skeptics want to claim that it was. This is a big find. He says, we have an ancient text saying that the Israelites arrived around 1400 BC. That's the Bible. And then we have evidence of them on a mountain where the Bible says that they were, writing in a language that the Bible says that they used, I think a fair-minded person might be willing to draw the conclusion inductively that there were Israelites there. And they're writing about curses on Mount Ebal, like how perfect. And so this is just something that came out in the last week or two, and there will be more development on this in terms of dating and whatnot. But it's pretty, pretty fascinating and pretty exciting, actually. And so tonight, April 6th, we're going to be talking about, we finished off last time when the Babylonians come into Bethlehem. And then next week, we'll actually probably be talking about Jesus, because I don't think there's any way we're going to be able to get through all of this. I think we'll get to the beginning of Jesus, and then we may have to have another session for New Testament manuscripts, or maybe drop that, or wait till the next class starts up. So... This is our timeline, and I just like reminding you every time, this is the progression of the history of Israel. In 2000, every 500-year period, you have a major event. 2000, Abraham. 1500, Moses. 1000, David. 500, the rebuilding of the temple, and there's always a 400-year period, roughly, in between. By the way, Abraham, Moses, and David are the most mentioned three figures in the New Testament. They're most often cited. And they land perfectly between these periods. So as we go, this is our timeline that we talked about last week. This is when Solomon builds the temple, 970. They have a united kingdom. Solomon's son messes it up. The kingdom splits from north and south. And the kingdom of Israel starts and right out of the gates, they're idolatrous. They're terrible. Every single one of their kings is wicked to the bone. Tons of them are assassinated. It's just a wicked kingdom. The southern kingdom of Judah is not a whole lot better. God's people have never been a prize. <laughs> yeah. At least they wouldn't be in my eyes. To God, we're a treasured possession, which is amazing because it's largely wicked. There are a few really good kings. 722 comes along and we talked about the Assyrians. Remember them? They're the world's first terrorists. They're terrible. They conquer the northern tribes. And they try to conquer Jerusalem, but they can't. And so Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah persist until 586 when the Babylonians come along. And that's when Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Remember the Assyrians, this is them. This is what they paint all over their palaces and their, their ancient artifacts. It's them torturing people, carrying them away by hooks that are inserted in their noses and cheeks and cutting off arms and legs. And this is why Jonah was like, I am not going to those people. They were really bad. And so this is the map of what it looks like before Assyria gets really serious. You can see, you know, you've got Israel to the north. That's the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, the Philistines, Moabites, Ammonites, the kingdom of Aram or Syria. And everybody's kind of positioning. And then Syria comes along. And Syria is going to go through and they are going to wipe out all of them. They take them over. They lead them into exile. They kill them and they repopulate. You know where the Samaritans come from? When the Assyrians took over the northern tribe of Israel, they said, we're not only going to wipe them out and kill them and send them scattered all over the world, 
but to just remove their name from ever even being in history or continuing, we're going to send our Assyrian people back to the land of Israel to interbreed with them. The result was the Samaritans. So you wonder why the Jews of the south and of the far north up here in Galilee, why they hated the Samaritans. It was because they were half-breeds. They were intermingled with the Assyrians, and that was a shameful period of Israel's history, and so they were thought to be inferior. So that when the Assyrians come through, even the historical books will say they conquer just about everything. I mean, they go up into the old Hittite territories and conquer all that. They go down and conquer the Egyptian kingdom, the, the Sinai Peninsula. They conquer all of the area of Babylon and the Elamites and everything over here. But they can't conquer this little area. And you remember last week, God gives a promise to Hezekiah. They will not enter the city. And God goes out and defeats the Babylonians in a single night. And Barosus, Chaldeus, and other people affirm this. They never, ever take the city of Jerusalem. And God, by his mercy to one godly king, for the sake of this godly king, spares the entirety of the kingdom. And they persist until you get to around 600. And God is absolutely appalled at what the kingdom of Judah had become. Kings, we talked about this, were sacrificing their sons in fires, offering their sons up to the gods of Moab and Ammon. They were terrible. They had decorated the temple with pagan images. They turned their back on the Lord. They were doing unbelievably wicked things in the name of God. And so God, speaking through a flurry of prophets, the major prophets, Isaiah is much earlier, back in the days of Assyria, but the other major prophets like Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel are alive during this time. And they all come forward basically with a message. Jeremiah especially is coming and saying, you have offended God. You need to turn. Your city is going to be destroyed. God is going to walk away from the kingdom. And they brand him a traitor. And they say, you've turned on us. You, you're dispiriting our people. No way God would ever allow Babylon to conquer us. And God is coming saying, I'm not going to allow you to continue to make a mockery of my name. Turn or I will lift my glory right up out of this temple and I will abandon you and hand you over for a season. And that's what Israel chooses. And I want you to hear the heart of God when Jeremiah is writing. I love the prophet Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet. But this is God's mission to him. Hear this. Jeremiah, I want you to go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Here's the words of God. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride, you loved me and you followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. What fault did your fathers find in me? Hear that. Like, you ever imagine God being invested in his people and asking questions like that? Like, you, you loved me and I was faithful to you. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They, they followed worthless idols and they became worthless themselves. They didn't ask, where's the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt? The priest did not ask, where's the Lord? Even your priests are not asking, where's the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not even know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. And then he says to the angelic witnesses, be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins, man. This is super, super, super practical here. My people have committed two sins. They've, and you're like, what? They've committed countless sins. Are you kidding? They've done all kinds of wickedness. And God goes, no, I can basically boil it down to these two. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns. And a cistern's a big pit in the ground where they would keep water in the ancient world. Broken cisterns that can't hold water. And that is the human condition. 
You have God who's like, I'm a spring of living water. I am here to satisfy you. I'm eager to satisfy you. I'm a spring. It's never-ending nourishment. Just come to me. I'll never fail you. And they're all going, no, I'd rather dig my own cisterns and have control over this. And you just slave away digging and dumping water in and it keeps leaking out and it's exhausting and you end up dying of thirst because your cisterns always fail and God is jumping up and down saying, what did I do? When did I fail you? Why are you walking away from me? My priests, my prophets, my kings, the people who study the law, nobody seeks after me. That's the story of God's relationship with Israel. And so here come the Babylonians and first they conquer the Philistines. 603, they come along and this was just as Zephaniah, one of my favorite prophets wrote. He said, Gaza, one of the cities of the Philistines is gonna be just deserted. Ashkelon will become a desolation. Ashdod's people will be driven out at noon. Ekron will be uprooted. And sure enough, archaeologists have gone, they've uncovered Ekron, and all over that you find a destruction layer from the Babylonians. You find Babylonian weapons in the ground there, and it's exactly what you should find. Then God comes to Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar, this mighty king of Babylon, comes, and he is so overpowering with his army that when he comes, they basically say, <laughs> we surrender and he doesn't destroy Jerusalem. But he takes 10,000 of their best men and takes them into exile and he puts in a puppet king. It's like the more international geopolitical stage changes, the more it stays the same. But this is what the Bible says, is the Lord declared Nebuchadnezzar removed all the treasures from the temple of the Lord. He plunders it. You wanna know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? My best guess is right here, gone. God's glory departed from the temple. They pick it up. They walk away. They take the, the lampstand. They take everything and they burn it down for gold. From the royal palace and they took away all the gold articles that King Solomon of Israel had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried into exile all Jerusalem, all the officers and fighting men. This is when Daniel the prophet is taken off to Babylon and all the craftsmen and artisans, a total of 10,000 men, and that's 597. And he says, okay, I'm going to appoint a new king. And he takes the existing king that was there and he leads him off into captivity to Babylon. That guy's name was Jehoiakim. Say Jehoiakim. And then he made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. And it's like, I'm going to put who I want in power and I'm even going to change your name. You have authority over nothing. You go into the records when you're digging around in Babylon. Remember, he takes Jehoiakim into exile and in this we find stones right and it said this tablet's discovered in the ruins of Babylon and it records the daily rations of oil and barley that were provided for the deposed who king Jehoiakim and it says 10 sela which was an ancient measurement of oil to the king of Judah Yawakim two and a half sela to the offspring of Judah's king that's what it says on that stone so just like the bible says this king was taken off into exile there he is. This is the receipt for that king. This is from the Babylonian Chronicles. So you read whatever that mix match, chicken scratch carvings are on that stone. And this is what it says. The king of Babylon assembled his army. And after he had invaded the land of Hatti, which is to the north, that's Turkey. He laid siege to the city of Judah, Jerusalem. He conquered the city and took the king prisoner. He installed in his place a king of his own choice. And after he had received rich tribute, he sent them forth to Babylon. What did the Bible say? Okay, you remove Yahweh and you put him over here and you put a new king in his place. And the Babylonian Chronicles, like you could pick it up and lay it down in Second Kings. And you'd be like, yeah, they're saying the exact same thing. There it is. Totally reliable. Extra biblical source. The Sharsakim tablet was found in Iraq in the late 1800s, deciphered by the British Museum in 2007 when we finally understood these languages. And it records a contribution of gold from Nebuchadnezzar's chief officer, Nabu Sharushakim. I'm going to pretend that's exactly how you pronounce it. <laughs> and Jeremiah, by the way, so you, and this has nothing to do with the Bible. Like it doesn't say, and Israel. Like it's just saying, hey, this guy who is a chief officer gave a bunch of gold. 
Well, Jeremiah puts in a throwaway detail in chapter 39, verse 3, where he mentions this guy and says that he was included among all the officials of the king of Babylon. Like totally a worthless throwaway fact. But if you're thinking, oh, the Bible's made up, like you're just thinking Jeremiah's going, oh, yeah, let's make up a name. How about uh, Nabu Sharu Sikkenen? You know, well, there he is. Real person, Jeremiah, is, what does that tell you about what Jeremiah is doing? He is writing careful history, actual people. So all these names that we don't recognize, this gives us confidence that if this one's real, they're going to be real, even if we haven't found evidence of them. This is the remnants of a palace that would have been stunning. This was, it doesn't look stunning now. <laughs> I, I would not like to live there. But I bet if you saw it back in the day with all the ivory and plants and everything else, that place would have been beautiful. But that was Nebuchadnezzar's palace. So Jeremiah later on describes, okay, right now, up to this point, Babylon has installed a puppet master, a puppet king, right? And he's allowed them to kind of hang around, but he's got ultimate authority. He's, he's put in the king, you just pay me the taxes and I'll be good to let you live. And it says, therefore... What happens is that king that they installed actually rebels and tries to lead a revolt. The Babylonian king hears about it and says, we gave you your chance, you rebelled against you, and now we will kill you. And we're going to destroy everything that you have and everything that you love. And so Jeremiah says this, writes this, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans. So God is saying, this is my judgment, not Nebuchadnezzar's into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. And the Chaldeans, which is another way of saying Babylonians, who are fighting against the city, shall come and set the city on fire and burn it. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them, the Israelites, persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They built high places, a Baal in the valley of the son of Enom, to offer up their sons and their daughters to Moloch and the fires of pagan worship. Thus says the God of Israel concerning the city of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, and then God gives a word of comfort. Behold, even though you're this relentlessly unfaithful to me, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them out in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell in safety and they shall be my people and I will be their God and his mercy and his patience knows no end. If you just put together the track record of Israel and the track record of the people of God, the priests, the prophets, I mean, it was atrocious how they treated God, and yet God refuses to abandon his covenant with them, even though he's going to allow them to face judgment for a while. And what happens, and I love this, I want you to follow the timeline of the whole story of Israel, right? Remember, it starts with Abraham, and where does God call Abraham from? Well, he leaves Ur, which is in the whole Babylonian area, Tigris and Euphrates, and he goes to Haran, and then God says, leave your place, I'm going to bring you to a land that I'm going to show you, and he travels from the far east to come over into the, land, the promised land. And then what happens? His sons, four generations later, or three generations later, Joseph goes down to Egypt, and all of their descendants get enslaved. And then God raises up a deliverer who delivers them out of slavery, delivers them out of this foreign bondage, leads them out. Then Joshua comes along, leads them across the Jordan River into the promised land. Hang on to this progression. They establish judges. The kingdom of God begins. Then David moves the capital of all the kingdom to Jerusalem. Solomon builds the great temple. And from that point, there's a king on the throne of David. But they mocked God, and they mocked God, and they mocked God, and watch what he does. In this one swoop of judgment, there is no longer a king on the throne. Solomon's temple, think we're working backwards, right? All the accomplishments of Israel. 
There's no longer a king on that throne. Solomon's temple, destroyed. Jerusalem, the city that David built, gone. The reigning kingdom of God, gone. They're taken, remember Joshua, who led them past the Jordan? Nebuchadnezzar leads them out past the Jordan. Moses, who led them out of foreign bondage, now Nebuchadnezzar's leading them into foreign exile and bondage. Abraham, who had left the Far East to come over to the Promised Land, now Nebuchadnezzar is taking them from the Promised Land back to the Far East. And in a matter of months, God has undone 1,400 years of redemptive history, it seems. What does that say? God's holiness is not to be mocked, and yet he will still keep every one of his promises to his people, despite all of our defiance. And so what do do we see in that? This is just kind of cool. So Jeremiah is a big figure during the destruction of Jerusalem. And we're told in the Bible, if you read through Jeremiah, it will say it's belong, like uh, down at the bottom, it says, so Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah. And while Jeremiah dictated all the words that spoke to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. So Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord, Baruch, the son of Neriah, is there writing it all down. On the left, you see two seals and both of them have these words inscribed on them, belonging to Barukiah, son of Neriah, the scribe. It's a real person. He signed real documents in the city of Jerusalem and in the city of Lachish. And so in these bula, where he would have put his seal impression, there we have Baruch, the son of Neriah, who is the scribe of Jeremiah. It's crazy to think that one of these scrolls might have been put in the original writings of Jeremiah, because this was his scribe, real people. So this guy was named, so Baruch read the words of Jeremiah, and we're told, just kind of a throwaway detail in Jeremiah 36, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the secretary. Easy to make up those names, <laughs> you know, right? Well, this seal says, Garumah Yahu, son of Shaphan. And so anytime you have an ayah in English, it's a shortened for Yahweh, Yahu, is where you'd see it in the Hebrew. And so Gamariah, son of Shaphan, there it is. So you have king's royal officials. So Jeremiah, you'll remember, is absolutely hated by the people because everybody hears his words, destruction is coming, and everyone goes, oh, the troops are getting scared. He's, he's making people fear, you know, this is a false prophet. No way God would ever allow the destruction of Jerusalem. And so these two seals come from two guys, Yahushal, Ben Shalem Yahu, definitely the way that's pronounced, and Gadol Yahu, Ben Pashur. Both of those men are listed in Jeremiah 38 as royal officials who demand that Jeremiah be put to death for his prophecy. Remember Jerusalem, Jerusalem city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to you? These are those guys. Those names, those seals, impressions were made by guys who wanted Jeremiah dead, just like the Bible talked about. They look at impressions and seals and inscriptions out of Jeremiah. And one of the things is, is it's crazy how his listing of names, because he's got a ton of names in his book, match everything else that you find in the epigraphic evidence. Inscriptions, bulas, seals, all that stuff. The proportions of these names match, except he's dealing with more religious people. So it's Yahwistic names, which means their names end with that ayah or Yahoo uh, or El, names ending with El, like Samuel. That's a generic name for God. Um, And you see that, the same proportion. This is a wall, a section of the wall that survived the Babylonian conquest that's still there. And remember, there are skeptics and members of the PLO that say that Israel never even lived there. <laughs> Remember that? How, cr- how crazy is all this? I mean, it's everywhere you see evidence of this. And so that's part of a wall that survived. This was a siege tower. So as Nebuchadnezzar is coming, Zedekiah, who's the king that rebelled, who was the puppet king, who said, you know what? I, we're making a run for it. We're going to stand against them. They start building siege towers around the city 
to defend against Nebuchadnezzar's incoming. And all around these siege towers that they've uncovered from this time period, you find arrowheads where the Babylonians came and just started firing away into the city and killing people. And it's weird for a moment to imagine that those arrowheads missed, but they were in the same quiver as other arrows that killed people back then and took control of the city. It's pretty wild. So the Lakish letter, so as Nebuchadnezzar's coming, one of the guys there, Hosea, writes to King Zedekiah about the status of Lakish. And you read on these ancient scrolls, he says that they are watching for signal fires. Have you ever seen Lord of the Rings? I love that scene where it's like you light a signal fire and the next person sees it and they light a signal fire and person way off in the distance lights it. And it's a way to get a message like warning, something's on the way and you can see it from a distance. They lit the signal fire. Here comes the army. And so Hosea is like, we're, we're waiting for the signal fires. When is Babylon going to get here? And he writes, the words of the officers are not good. That to weaken your hands and to weaken the knees of the hands of men, this massive army that seems unstoppable is marching toward us. We're waiting for the signal fires and we're quaking. We have no strength because we're that scared. And Jeremiah in his writings mentions that the, uh, these signal fires and he tells people, run, do not fight. The Lord is not with you in this battle. Can you imagine? So they come and they destroy Jerusalem and he set fire to the temple, the royal palace and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army broke down the walls. The commander of the guard carried into exile any of the people who remained in the city and Babylon conquered massive swatches of territory, all of the promised land. And so God gives commands to his people who are being taken off into exile, right? We can relate to this because we're no longer living in a Christian society. I'm looking at polls that say this is the first generation that's growing up in a post-Christian culture where students, when you talk to them about the Bible, have no idea at all. Guys, we're living in Babylon again. And what is God's instructions for the exiles that are being taken into Babylon to live? He says, I want you to build houses. I want you to settle down. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to eat what they produce. I want you to marry and have sons and daughters. And I want you to, what? Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. In other words, you're going to go there and you're going to build a civilization while you're there and the prophets are going to go there and you're going to benefit the city like Daniel did and you're going to do things that better the society there. And oh, by the way, when I've carried you back to Jerusalem, we tend to forget what was left behind in the area of Babylon and in Persia, which will be the next kingdom that takes over that region of the world. Do you know that when the gospel spark happened and Jesus is crucified and he's raised from the dead and he ascends into heaven and eventually in time, <laughs> the apostles get moving and they go take the gospel to the ends of the earth. This surprised me. Do you know where most Christians in three, dec in three centuries after the ministry of Jesus, do you know that there were more Christians to the east of Jerusalem? than to the West. We tend to think, you read the letters of Paul and he's writing to Rome, well, that's to the West. Or he's writing to Ephesus, to the West. He's writing to the places in Turkey, like Galatia, that's to the West. And everything we hear, we think West. But there were more Christians in modern day Iran and Iraq in the early centuries of Christianity than there were to the West, why? Because these people, this remnant that was taken to Babylon and taken to Persia, what was their hope? They were looking at the scriptures. They were looking for the promise of a Messiah. And that word went throughout that culture. And when the gospel spark happened, it exploded over there. Revival. And so here's a question for you. Was it pointless? Let me ask you this question, because you look, you look at this and every one of us inside of us wants to question God and be like, how could you let that happen? Why would you let your people be taken off into exile, God? I want to know. Well, they're scattered all over the world. And you know what they do when they're scattered all over the world? They sit there and think, why did God allow this to happen? But we have no other hope. 
So we're going to hold on to the scriptures, and because we can't go to the temple, because it's destroyed, we're going to build synagogues everywhere we go, and we're going to teach the prophecies. And when the gospel spark is lit, and the apostle Paul goes all over the world, every city he goes into, guess where he goes? He goes to the synagogue. Why are there synagogues all over the world? Well, because there was an exile. Because there was a great diaspora. And everywhere that Paul goes, it's like these cultures have just been soaking in the writings of the prophets that are talking about a kingdom that's coming, a king that's coming, who conquers death, who defeats sin, who's establishing a reign of eternal righteousness. And had the exile never happened, those synagogues would have never been built. And all of the apostles that go out with this evangelistic crusade would have had nowhere to go and say, it's fulfilled. It's like God is not surprised with the exile. He's using a judo technique on the world. They're looking and saying, see, we've destroyed the people of God. We've burned down the temple. We have destroyed Jerusalem. And God says, yeah, send them out. They're just preparing (laughs) <laughs> they're preparing the world to explode with the gospel. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Was God taken by surprise? No, he uses the world's wickedness against itself to advance his kingdom. But I tell you what, like let that resonate with you because I can guarantee you that the people who were going to those synagogues thinking, what point could you possibly have in this suffering? God had one a big one. And he's carrying it out. And so he tells them, I want you to build houses. I want you to make Babylon prosper. I want you to preach the word. I want you to build synagogues. I want you to do all that stuff because there's going to come a time when the gospel that you're not aware of yet is going to explode there. And this actually is really fascinating. More than a hundred tablets of that era from Jewish settlements. Why are there Jewish settlements in Babylon? Because this happened. Jewish settlements between the Tigris and Euphrates River, one of them is called Al Yahuda. Well, what does that mean? It literally means Judah. It's like New Judah. Another one of them is called Shebar, where the prophet Ezekiel saw his visions, real places. And so the tablets not only reveal that, but it reveals something surprising. Like when God says, I want you to go and build farms, it's like, wait a minute, are exiles allowed to own land? How do you build a farm? How do you build houses? Well, you know from those tablets that the Babylonians allowed them to buy property farm the land, buy animals, enter contracts. So they were able to do exactly what God called them to do. We know that a lot of them from Jeremiah's writing went down to Egypt, to Pharaoh Hophra, which a lot for a long time people said that guy didn't exist. It was a made up name. Well, there he is. That's his, that's his tablet and very real that they went there. This is another figure from the writings of 2 Kings, where it says Nebuchadnezzar appointed Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, to be over the people left behind in Judah. And it says Ahikam helped to spare Jeremiah from the angry mob who wanted to kill him. And one generation before that, we learn that his dad, Shaphan, read the book of the law inside the, in the presence of King Josiah when there was a revival. And on this seal, you find both of those names. This is Ahikam, son of Shaphan, on that seal. These are real people with a real genetic history. The Ammonite king Baalus, I know this is a lot, but we're rifling through it. The Baalus seal is made of agate, a type of mineral. It's really beautiful, actually. And it's inscribed with the name of a biblical Ammonite king who arranged the assassination of that governor we just talked about, Gadaliah. He got, he got killed, and so there he is. And another bulla discovered says, belonging to Milcom or servant of Balas. So these are real people. And so here's something that's kind of a fascinating story. If you remember in the book of Daniel, Daniel serves through Babylonian kings. Then the Babylonians get conquered, and he's going to serve through the Persian kings. But the last Babylonian king, if you remember, Daniel has an encounter with him. And he's called into a banquet because what do they see? You remember? There's a hand writing on the wall, and Daniel is called to interpret whatever this is that's being written on the wall, and we're told that after he interprets it, he says, this very night, your kingdom's going to be taken away from you. And then the Bible says, sure enough, Babylon is conquered in one night, and you hear that, and you think, man, like, for real, 
a siege that lasts, an attack, not even a siege, that lasts one night and overthrows an entire kingdom, an entire empire that was as big as the map that we just looked at? Is that even possible? So Belshazzar is holding this banquet. Everybody's getting drunk. He sees the handwriting on the wall. Daniel translated the writing, and it's where this famous expression comes from. The king had been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And so his kingdom would be stripped. And Daniel wrote, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. Well, there's a couple things. One, the skeptics deny that Belshazzar ever even existed. They would claim that Nabodness was the last Babylonian empire and that Belshazzar is entirely made up. Is that true? And did this even happen in a night like it says? Well, we know, thankfully, from the writings of Nabodness. Remember they say, no, 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 Belshazzar didn't exist. Nabodness is the last king. Well, let's hear what Nabodness has to say, because this is his cylinder that we've discovered. So in Daniel 5, we're to told Belshazzar is the last king. Skeptics claim that he's fictional. But in 1881, archaeologists find the Nabodness cylinder. It's translated much, much later. And Nabodness writes this, as for Belshazzar, why is he writing about a fictional son? He, he must have been on drugs or something, right? So King Nabodness wrote, as for Belshazzar, there he is. The eldest son, my offspring, and still reverence for your great Godhead in his heart. And may he not commit any cultic mistake May he be sated with a life of plenitude. May he live a long time with an abundance. So there it is. There's Belshazzar. So the, the way that the story goes, that's ancient Babylon. And you can see you have the Euphrates River that runs right through the middle of Babylon. And they would put walls on each side. But they allowed the water to come beneath the walls so that they could farm inside the city walls. It made the city pretty much impenetrable. So how do you conquer that land? You, you can siege it all day long. They've got like infinite water supply, crops inside. It makes it very safe. Well, we learn that Daniel, his version, that they fall in a night. Let's go outside the Bible and see what other recently discovered writings tell us. Xenophon, famous historian, says, My friends, the river has made way for us and given us entrance into the city. Those appointed to attack the guard fell upon them as they were drinking by the blazing fire. And without waiting, they dealt with them as their foes. And when the day dawned and those in possession of the citadels discovered that the city was taken and the king was slain, they surrendered the citadels too. And one night, let me tell you how this happens. They divert the water supply and the water level drops. And they go very quietly as everybody is drinking and drunk in this feast. They go under the wall with the lowered water and they come upon a bunch of drunk soldiers and they conquer the city like that. One night. And in the morning when they find out that the king is dead and that their capital city had fallen to the Persians, all the other citadels go, we give up. It's like they're all France. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bad joke, bad joke. <clears throat> Ancient historian Herodotus writes about this too. It says, Cyrus dealt with it. There's a name that's spot on. Drawing off the river by a canal into the lake, which was till now a marsh. He made the stream to sink till its former channel could be forded. When this happened, the Persians who were posted with this intent made their way into Babylon by the channel of the Euphrates, which had now sunk about to the height of the middle of a man's thigh. And they record all this. The Beostan inscription, written in three languages, um, tells about this conquest. And so, is there, so what happens is Babylon comes and conquers Israel, Jerusalem, Judah, right? God's judgment, the, the glory of God departs from the temple and God says, you're going to go off into exile for a period of 70 years. You're going to be all out there, but I'm going to draw you back. In 70 years, I'm going to come and dwell with you again. And he, he promises that through the prophets. So in 539, that's when the Persians come and they conquer Babylon. And now from 539, Persia is in control of all the world. And that's really important because what happens is the Bible tells us in Ezra that Cyrus is used by God to allow them to go back into the promised land. He like undoes their exile and he issues this decree according to the Bible. 
This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. So there you have it, Cyrus. It's really kind of him, right? Oh, not only am I going to allow you to go back to Jerusalem, but here, here's some provision. Make it nice. Why would you do that? Sure enough, we discover the Cyrus Cylinder. So remember, he's the guy who conquers Babylon, and this is what the Cyrus Cylinder says. I returned to these sanctuaries the images that had been in them, and I made their dwellings permanent. I gathered all their people and returned them to their habitations. So in the Cyrus Cylinder, which is created by his own authority, what is he saying? I'm sending all the exiles back home, and I want their habitations rebuilt. Gee, that sounds familiar. That sounds like almost exactly what Ezra just told us. And all of this is really fascinating. It's during Persia that the story of Esther happens. Remember that she becomes the queen of the king of Persia? This is kind of fascinating. So they find a, and Persepolis, no, Persepolis, Persepolis, treasury tablets. And so among these treasury tablets, archaeologists are looking around and they find a financial receipt. It's not uncommon. But it's written by a guy named Marduka. Okay, that's interesting. What does that sound like? Mordecai, right? And it's to the dignitaries at Susa. Does anybody remember where Mordecai worked? Susa. And you, does anybody remember what his job was? Well, we're given hints. It says, scholars believe the tablet was written by Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who was counted among all the royal officials at the king's gate, where? In Susa. And remember, when Haman has his plot to kill the Jews, the story of Esther tells us that Mordecai had access to an edict that recorded what? The exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. So who would have access to that? A figure who's financial, named Marduka, who's in Susa. What are the chances? So you're looking at a receipt. <laughs> it's just wild to me. You're looking at a receipt, almost certainly from the hand of Mordecai. Pretty cool. Real guy. Returning exiles that come there. You know, Haggai. So we're working our way to the New Testament. And we're told, in his lineage, the sons of Zerubbabel, Mishalom, and Hananiah. And it tells us that Shelemeth was their sister. Just kind of a throwaway detail. Well, up there you see there's the Bula of Shulamith. There she is, the son of Elnathan, or the uh, wife of Elnathan. And Elnathan, who's also listed in Ezra 8.16, there's his Bula. So again, you have real people. Rebuilding of Jerusalem. Who are the, who's the famous person that helps to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuilds the walls? Nehemiah, right? So Nehemiah, when he starts rebuilding the walls, he is sent back from, he was a cupbearer to the Persian king. And the Persian king's like, I want you to go back. Nehemiah is sad because he hears that Jerusalem has not been rebuilt to its former standards. And he's like, I want to go back and I want to rebuild. And so the king says, go. And he goes and immediately he starts work on the wall. And there you find this wall dates exactly to the time of Nehemiah. This would have been where Nehemiah built. And by the way, there's arrowheads and pottery shards that are under this tower dating to this time. Why are there arrowheads? Because all of their neighbors hate the idea that Jerusalem is going to be restored to power. And so people like Sanballat and Tobias the Ammonite, they come and they say, they frustrate them and they threaten them. And so they've got to work with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Remember all that? And they're working to finish the wall. Well, we know that the, this is what the Bible says. When Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to the walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were angry and they all plotted to come together and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. Are these real people? Well, sure enough, we have discovered this is the palace of Tobiah the Ammonite. There it is, partially redone. Then we look and, and we find Papyrus from Sanballat. Remember, this is the guy who wants 
to cause trouble for Nehemiah. And what does it say? This is written to that governor, and it says, from, from the Jewish exiles, and they're filing a complaint against Sanballat's son. It says, we have set forth the whole matter in a letter in our name to Deleah and to Shelemiah, the sons of Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, the Persian satrap, our Semis know nothing of all that was perpetrated on us. Well, what are they talking about? So here you have Jews that are saying, this guy Sanballat, we're filing an appeal because he's violating what the king has said. They're coming and attacking us. They're harassing us. We demand that somebody do something against Sanballat. You go elsewhere in that region and inside one of the Sumerian caves of Deliah, researchers found, this is crazy, a mass grave of more than 300 people covered with mats, and along with their bodies, they discover an ancient Sumerian scroll. And on it, you can see that bula with the inscription, which is the governor of Samaria, a son of Sanballat. And so what were they doing? When, when they found a Jew that was outside of the region, they were committing mass genocide and burying them in mass graves. And on top of it, you see the order from the son of Sanballat. It's like... The, right affirming what the scriptures are saying. This is the last one before we get to the New Testament. But it's a prophecy that comes from Ezekiel, and it's just kind of fascinating because it's a wild prophecy, and you think, what in the world are you even talking about? So Ezekiel writes this, The sovereign Lord says, I'm against you, O Tyre. Tyre is a city that was part of the Phoenician cities, and they betrayed the people of God. And so now Ezekiel is saying, you're going to get yours. I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers, and I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. All the buildings just... Her settlements on the mainland will be ravaged by the sword. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw stones, your stones, your timber, and your rubble into the sea. And I will make you a bare rock and you will become a place to spread fishnets. What in the world is that all about? When I bring the ocean depths over you and its vast waters cover you and you're thinking, okay, is it a tsunami? Like what's going to come that's going to make them spread with fishnets? Well, this is... Island Tyre today, and in the background you see mainland Tyre. And when Alexander the Great comes against this city, he conquers mainland Tyre. So all of the buildings and everything else that are in mainland Tyre, this is pretty cool, just like Ezekiel says, he comes through and he demolishes them all and basically lays them flat and makes the whole place nothing but ruins and bare rock. And you got all these buildings and stones and timbers and everything else, and he thinks, what in the world will I, am I going to do with all this stuff? And he says, well, there's island tire out there, and they're refusing to surrender to us. So you know what he does? He says, hey, troops, you see all that rubble, all the buildings, all the timbers? I want you to scrape that whole city bare, and I want you to take all the rubble and the ruins, and I want you to make a land bridge, and we're just going to slowly build a walkway out to the island. <laughs> Pretty wild. And so this is one of the historians who's writing in the first century BC, and he tells us what happened. It says, the king saw that the city could hardly be taken by sea because of the engines mounted along its walls and the fleet that it possessed, while from the land it was almost unassailable because it lay four furlongs or half a mile away from the coast. Nevertheless, he determined to run every risk and make every effort to save the Macedonian army, Alexander's army, from being held in contempt by one single undistinguished city. So you're talking about the pride of Alexander here. He demolished what was called Old Tyre and set many tens of thousands of men to work. Can you imagine watching this? Carrying stones to construct a mole two plethora, 200 feet in width. And he drafted into service the entire population of the neighboring cities. And the project advanced rapidly because the workers were so numerous. And a hundred years ago, you could still see that was the land bridge that Alexander built from mainland Tyre to island Tyre. And he left Tyre a bare rock scraped clean. And this ha Ezekiel predicted this. Ezekiel's writing 250 years before this takes place. 
It's just kind of fascinating. Love that. So you get to Israel. Let me see what time we got. Um, there's lots of stuff in Israel. We're going to fast forward through this going really fast. This is the place of trumpeting. So like you remember how skeptics say, oh, Israel never, re- they never lived there. They, Israel never had the temple there. And on all these rocks, you see like, it's just absurd. So here's part of a temple wall with the inscription on it that says the place of trumpeting because during the feast, they would blow trumpets and they would begin Rosh Hashanah or whatever. And so there's the place of trumpeting on one of the walls because that was part of the feast. You have a temple warning that says that any foreigner, right, no stranger or foreigner is allowed to enter within the balustrade round the temple because it was just for Jews. And anybody who goes in, whoever is caught will be responsible to himself for his death, which will ensue. They took this like seriously. As a Gentile, stay away, right? What is that? If that's not evidence that they had a temple, that the Jews were there, like, what is this? I mean, it's just absurd that they deny this. Here is some evidence of Herod's tiles that were on the street. They found massive, massive numbers, 600 floor tiles that look like that. So when you walked around first century Jerusalem, unbelievably beautiful and ornate. The Magdala stone, this was found in the place where Mary Magdalene comes from, and it's beautiful, but it In that, you see a lot of the temple imagery. You see the golden lampstand. You see the jars. You see images from Ezekiel uh, that are captured into this. Really fascinating. Mikvahs. So you find these Jewish ritual baths that are all over the outskirts of Jerusalem. So remember when Peter gives his Pentecost sermon and it says 3,000 people are baptized that day? And you're like, where in the world were they baptized? There's these mikvahs all over the place. That would have been filled with water because when people are going to the temple, they get down in these and their baths where they get clean to go into the temple and they're all over the place. This was something that skeptics gave a hard time in the gospel of John where they said that the pool of Bethesda never existed, that it was made up, that archaeologists couldn't find it. Then they keep digging and they find the pool of Bethesda and thankfully John gives us a detail where it says that it's surrounded by five covered colonnades. You see that down on the bottom? And so when they're digging, guess what they find? You can look and see them over on the right-hand side. One, two, three, four, five covered colonnades that would have gone over this pool of Bethesda. They argued the same about the pool of Siloam. Oh, this is where Jesus heals and has the blind man go and bathe. They said, oh, that didn't exist until, this is pretty cool, in 2005, city workers are going out and they're digging around to repair a sewer line. (laughs) And it's like, what is this? And so they come across the pool of Siloam and you can see the steps that would have led down into this pool, which is pretty massive. Here's another sign that is the place of sacrifice, Corban, which was right near the Wailing Wall, which shows us that this was a place of sacrifice. The caves of Qumran, um, We're going to skip through this so I can get to this last one and have enough time. So now let's fast forward. That was all second temple period. There's 400 years of silence between the last prophet and the time of Jesus. And that's intentional. When Jesus comes along, he is going to be described as the new Moses. Moses is the prophet that's sent to Israel to bring them out of bondage to the serpent-headed Pharaoh, the land of death and bondage, after a period where there was no prophetic movement for 400 years. Genesis to Exodus, there's a 400-year period where nothing is happening, seems. Now when you get to Jesus, there's a period of 400 years, and the people are in bondage to a foreign oppressor, and everything is going wrong, and so they're waiting for a new Moses. They're waiting for this king that is going to come along and build a kingdom that will never fail. And so we're just going to look at the the story of Bethlehem and the birth today and what the skies of the Magi may have been. But first, in the story of Jesus' birth, remember when Moses is born, there is a tyrannical Pharaoh who is determined to kill all of the baby boys of Egypt, right? Right? In the Gospels, you have a tyrannical Herod who is hell-bent on killing all of the baby boys of Bethlehem. And that guy's name is King Herod, and he is a crazy person. 
You don't want to be close to him. You don't want to be his friend. You definitely don't want to be his relative. He kills his predecessor who had power, 45 members of their official leading people in their party. John Hyrcanus, who was a revered elderly man at the time, he kills his brother-in-law. He kills his mother-in-law. He kills his wife. He kills countless suspicious citizens that he fears are plotting against him. He kills 300 of his own military leaders, captains, generals, whatever, because he fears that they're plotting against him. He just has no problem killing anyone. In fact, he kills three of his sons, Alexander, Aristobulus, and Antipater. And he's so wild that Caesar Augustus actually makes this comment about Herod the Great. I don't know why. Why does he get to be the great? Who made that decision? But Caesar Augustus says it is better to be Herod's pig, which is Hais, than his son, Huis. And so they sound similar. Better to be his pig than his son. And so why, would you expect that if somebody is killing people in Bethlehem, all boys under two, that there's probably something written about it? This is a trick question. Because there's not. But the slaughter of innocents, which is what it's called, Micah tells us that Bethlehem is small among the clans of Judah. It's a tiny place. It's not a big city, doesn't have a massive population. One of the, the leading archaeologists in all of history, William Albright, says that at the time of Jesus, there was probably only 300 people living in Bethlehem. It was, it was a shepherd's town. And if there's 300 people, then there's probably five to ten children under two. This is like a normal afternoon for Herod. Like it, it doesn't make headlines in the daily paper. That's just who Herod is. But it also helps to explain why there's no record of that. So let's jump into the birth story. And this is something that's a little bit different than archaeology. It's nothing that you can dig underneath your feet. This is stuff that exists over your head. Really fascinating. This is a theory. So <laughs> take this heresy for what it's worth. But Matthew 2 says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And so where do you think these magi came from? You know that Daniel is referred to in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, as a magus, which is the singular version of magi. So there's a school of magi that develops in the east who are really interested in the prophecies involving Israel. Why does that happen? It's because there was an exile. And Daniel and the prophets and people over there were faithful to the point where 600 years later, there are people from Babylon who see something in the sky and they're like, it's him. It's him. It's the Savior. Let's get on a camel and ride 700 miles <laughs> to, to Jerusalem to check this out. And so they arrive from the east and they show up and they say, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we came to worship him. And now notice what they said. We saw it. it. It's no longer there, but we saw it once upon a time. When we were way over in the east, we saw it and it left such an impression on us that we decided we're going to get on camels and we're going to drive or ride through the desert leaving our family and our businesses and everything that we know and love, and we're going to go 700 miles for months to get to Jerusalem on the off chance that someone knows what we're talking about. What would you have to see to make that happen? A lot, right? What do they see? Well, let's, I want to look into this. This is the journey that they probably made Ma massively long journey, so 800 miles. We know, and this is one of the cool things that comes with technology, but we know exactly what the night skies look like going back 2,000 years ago, going back 4,000 years ago. Why? Because the night sky moves like a clock. We can launch a rocket and know exactly where a planet or a moon or whatever is going to be because everything is mathematical. So we, if we know where things are going to be going forward, guess what? We can put it in reverse and we can wind the clock back and we can know where the stars and the planets and everything else would have been positioned a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. And we know that because of mathematics that were given to us by Kepler. 
So on the night, on a night in September of 3 BC, they're way far in the east. They look up at the night sky and they see that. Are you getting on your camels? Right? Two very, very bright stars that come into conjunction. I mean, they're laid right over. It looks like a light bulb almost. But those are two stars that are coming really, really close in conjunction. And if you zoom in on those, you see that it's two different things. It's Jupiter, which is the king of the gods. It's the king of the planets. This particular, what they called wandering star, because planets move around. They're not as fixed as the regular stars because they're rotating around the sun, revolving around the sun with us. And there's retrograde motion and different things. So that is the king wandering star. And Regulus, which has also been called Sharu in Babylonian culture, which means the king. Regulus in Latin, guess what that means? The king. This is the king star. King planet, king star. And they go... And they're kissing each other, like right on top of each other, which is like, okay, well, are you getting on your camel? I'm not getting on a camel. But what's interesting about this is because Jupiter's a planet and it's actually moving in a fixed field of stars, it's doing a dance. And so they look up in the night sky and they see Jupiter comes and and kisses three times. In Hebrew culture, what does it mean to repeat something three times? Holy, holy, holy. It means the most holy, the holy of holies. King, king, king. What does that mean? King of kings. Okay, I'm still not getting on a camel, right? Interesting, but I'm not getting on a camel. Now, how often does that happen? Roger Sennott, Harvard-educated astronomer, writes for Sky and Tele Telescope magazine, wanted to determine, okay, how often would that happen? Because that's a big deal. That's a pretty big deal. He says, the triple conjunction of Jupiter and Regulus, if you run the calculations forward and backwards, happens once every 38,000 years. It's never happened before. This is a once in a 38,000 year event. Very, very rare. And what's interesting, what is, what is the symbol for the royalty of the king of Israel? The lion, right? Right? Remember when God promises that he's going to send the Savior of the world to Judah and he gives a prophecy in Genesis, what does he say? You are a lion's cub, O Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Hear that. Until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of nation is his. Well, it just so happens that one of the horoscopes that rotates through the night sky as we go throughout the year is called Leo. And Leo, which by the way, predates biblical terms. They had this back in the days of old Babylon. Job, the oldest book in the Bible, talks about horoscopes, or not horoscopes. He talks about, what am I thinking of? Astrology, what are they called? Constellations, thank you. But there's Leo, and this is where that dance happens. King, 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 and the ruler's staff will not, the scepter will not depart until what? The ruler's staff is between his feet. And here you have Jupiter just dancing at the feet of Leo in the sky. And they're going, okay, that's kind of weird. I'm probably not getting on my camel. <laughs> right? Revelation and John, the apostle, writes this. And if you've ever read Revelation, you know, it's very difficult to understand. It's weird. He writes this. He says, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. Okay, what does he mean by that? Well, heaven can mean like where God dwells in the spiritual realm. It can mean above in the skies, the heavens. He says, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. He says, a woman clothed with the sun. Okay, that's kind of weird. Who's the woman clothed with the sun? The moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. Like we read that and we go, okay, that's got to be Mary. She's clothed with the sun. She's pregnant, cried out in pain as she's about to give birth. 
And another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child in the moment he's born. And so everybody throughout all of time has said, okay, John is very clearly talking about the nativity story. The woman clothed in the sun is clearly Mary. The child who's going to be born is clearly Jesus. And the dragon who's waiting to kill baby Jesus is Herod or Satan operating through Herod to kill the baby, right? And so that's always been the interpretation. But what's fascinating, remember, Jupiter's crowning Regulus in between the feet of Leo. When you look at the fixed field of constellations, after Leo comes up, guess what comes up behind him? Virgo. Guess what that means? The Virgin. Okay, that's, that's interesting. That's really fascinating. Huh. What are we going to see? What does it look like? We can run ast astronomer software and figure out, okay, if you're looking ahead and you see that's coming up with Leo, then the sun rises. Guess where the sun is? Right over Virgo. The sun is right over Virgo. Bam, right here. And she's shining like the sun. And wait, what did John say in Revelation? With the moon at her feet, guess what happens? So there's Virgo at the feet of the virgin. Up comes the new moon, a brand new moon, signifying like a picture of new life. And you know what comes up underneath her feet? The hydra. Remember the serpent with all the heads and crowns and everything else? John is talking about, and it's right underneath the lion. And notice where the lion's foot is. Don't you love that? It's coming. Love that. And so here you have this dance that's going on in the skies. And so when we look, is there any evidence to support astronomical and geological anomalies that are described in the Gospels? Because you look up and it's like, okay... King, 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 in the feet of the lion, up comes the virgin clothed in the sun, new moon at her feet, the multi-headed dragon coming up to pursue, the lion's foot is on top of this dragon in the sky, like, dude, I, I may get on a camel. <laughs> right? Like, this is pretty wild. And so, when you try to find out Jesus, the date of Jesus' death, because if, if God is painting a picture of what goes on, and the sky when Jesus is born. Because that happened, whether or not it points to anything involving Jesus, that drama is going on in the sky. And when they show up and they're like, we saw something in the sky that made us think that a Jewish lion, think the lion, Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, something just happened where we believe our king is born. Where is he? And everyone's like, what are you talking about? Because they're not paying attention to constellations and stars like the Magi were. So you fast forward, you try to find out what, when is Jesus' death? We know that Jewish Passover is on a Friday. We know that he died during the reign of Pilate. We know that there's only two times where Friday falls on, on these dates, and that's April 7th, 30 AD, or April 3rd, 33 AD. It's kind of like you got to figure out when they all match up. And there's strong evidence that this happens after Sejanus is executed when so Janus was making trouble with his people and he gets killed by Tiberius and Tiberius starts issuing warnings to all the governors saying, if you treat your people poorly to where they riot, I will kill you. And so what do the Jews do? You better put Jesus to death or we're going to Caesar. You better kill him or we're going to tell him that you're not putting down rebellions. And so Pilate washes his hands because he's scared. And so it's probably the second option. And you look on NASA's website and you go to that date, April 3rd, 33 AD, and you find that a lunar eclipse comes up. How does Acts describe it? The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. Why does a moon turn to blood? That's not just weird prophet talk. Um, it's called a blood moon when you have a lunar eclipse because it redshifts the light and it hits the moon and makes it look red. And so there's a lunar eclipse on that precise day. And when does it go into eclipse? I think this is just God showing off. Now this is 
This is 24-hour time, but if you were to convert that, what is it? It's 2.55 p.m. When does Jesus die on the cross? 3 p.m. on April 3rd, 33 A.D., right when the moon is going into its greatest moment of eclipse. And where does it happen? Look at the map. Right over the land of Israel. Now, I can't rig that. I can't make that a forgery that I pull out of the ground and like, I'm going to change that name. Like this is God giving validation of major cosmic events in the skies. That's amazing. And what, is, what else does that mean? So this is what, a, what red shifting looks like. It starts with a normal moon and as it goes into full eclipse, the moon will become blood red. It's blood moon. And so, you know what, where Jesus, where the moon is, when it turns into a full moon, blotted out in blood and eclipse, back at the foot of the virgin, the same place the new moon was. At the foot of the virgin. That's just wild poetry. And so, like, you can do with, what, with that what you want. Did God ordain all that? Is he up there just making, like, like David talks about that the, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Maybe that's not just hyperbole. The stars are crying out. They're praising his name. Their voice is loud unto all the earth. But here's the thing that boggles my mind. Like it's so cool to see that and to see that God is writing this poetic, beautiful play in the sky that most of the time when we look up, we have no idea what to make of any of it. But it's thrilling his heart. And what does that mean? If all of this moves like this, you know, it's, it's just moving like clockwork. Think of what that means for the sovereignty of God. It's not like this moment comes and he goes, oh, 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 oh I got to re-engineer everything. That means that from the moment he hurled the galaxies into motion, the very precise moment that that moon goes into eclipse is when his son dies and he's been in control of it all. Which means he has never left anything up to chance, which means he's in control of the minutia, which means that everything in your life is not out of his hands. It has been absolutely sovereignly orchestrated. Your victory is in hand even from the first moment God spoke things into being. That's wild. God is writing his love story in the stars. From the very moment he's created us. That is profound. And if he is that sovereign over every detail like that, what do we have to be worried about? Amen? Amen. He is good and he is powerful and he is on his throne and he is writing a beautiful beautiful story for his people and oh by the way throw away detail if you're on the moon looking back at the earth so you're taking the perspective of the moon which in this case is the sun and the drama right blotted out in blood a blood moon and you look back at the earth on the other side of the earth the earth is crossing in front of the sun in front of this, which is Aries, it's a constellation on the other side of the earth. It's a ram. It's a lamb, right? And so if you're in, on the moon, as the moon is in eclipse and you're looking back at the earth, that means the sun would be in eclipse because the sun would be perfectly blocking or the earth would be perfectly blocking the sun. Am I making sense? They're all lined up. You look backwards. This is what you would see looking backwards. Right at the heart of the lamb blacked out 3 o'clock April 3rd 33 AD the heart of the lamb goes dark Jesus Christ the lamb of God cosmic poetry in the sky you can't you can't make that up really really profound 
any thoughts or questions. Next time we're going to get into the life of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the aftermath of Jesus, Herod, Pilate, John the Baptist. It's coming. <laughs> really good stuff. But we're... Two weeks, that's right. Next week is Holy Week. If you show up, no one will be here. But I want to invite you, come to Monday, Thursday. All of our Thursday, Friday, Saturday events next week for Holy Week are at 7 o'clock in the evening right here. We're going to have a Monday, Thursday service. We're going to have a Good Friday service, Tenebrae service, which is just really profound. It gets darker as the night goes. It, you just kind of reflect on what Jesus has done for you. On Saturday, we have a silent vigil where you come. You reflect on prophecies and scriptures. It's totally silent. It's dark. There will be candles up here. And you're basically holding vigil. And it's like you're trying to enter into the experience of what would it have been like for your Savior to be in a tomb and all of his promises and everything else and feel the gravity of that so that when you come to church on Sunday morning and you get to experience the victory that the lamb that was slain is risen and he's coming as a conquering lion like he is on the throne victorious and you get to enter into that worship having celebrated that all those nights before i want to invite you to enter into that um any questions before i pray on stuff tonight yeah jim Um, I'd have to think on it. He doesn't always reveal it, but there is one. You know, nothing's by accident. You know, these people get wiped out. You know, one of the things I read that was interesting, I don't know that I have time for this, but what has that ever stopped me? Um, <clears throat> when, when Rome, actually, it's, it's counterintuitive, but when Constantine legalized religion to where Christians had the freedom to worship, and then at the end of that century, Theodosius came along and he said, we are going to make Christian, Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Well, Rome had massive territories and it was a big, great boon, at least initially for the church and the territory until, you know, bishops became a paid post of Rome and you had people that weren't passionate anymore. They were just taking a cush job and it actually hurt the church when the government endorsed it. The government endorses anything, it goes to hell in a handbasket, but... <laughs> <laughs> including the church apparently. But what happened is all of the area that was outside of the Roman Empire thought, well, if Rome has now co-opted Christianity and we're in this empire over here that's outside of Rome, have we lost our religion? And it really alienated a lot of people. Even though Christianity continued to thrive, it weakened over there even from that point on, which is a warning that as much as you want Christianity to hold influence in every sphere, never let the government dictate the terms to the church, ever. Yes? A bula is a... So in ancient times, they would, they would wear a ring that had a seal on it. And to express their authority, they'd take wax and they would roll their signet ring into the wax and it would harden on top of a letter and that wax would harden with the seal on it and they find those bula all over the so the bula is the hardened wax and they find those all over the place like we've we've found so many biblical figures for, in that manner um, it's pretty cool yeah yeah wine bottles whiskey bottles you still see that mm-hmm yeah, yeah, good, yeah. All right, let me pray for us. Father, Lord, you are so good. Your, your sovereignty is just amazing. The fact that you know the cost of our redemption from the moment of creation and you still write this in the sky, Lord. If we're interpreting that correctly, how amazing. And either, no matter what, Lord, you're a God that looks at your people as stubborn as we are, as unfaithful as we are, as... As often as we fail, as often as we betray you, Lord, you are faithful and you never leave or forsake us. You just consistently 
relentlessly come after us. You chase after your people at great cost to yourself. And you don't just tolerate us. You sing over us. We are your treasured possession, your great masterpiece. And Lord, I cannot wait to see what you do with us when you bring us into glory and you make us worthy of your name and you make us worthy of your hand forever and ever. Lord, I look forward to that day. In the meanwhile, we pray that you would help us to be faithful in this broken world, that we would be a source of hope and love and compassion, that we would mirror you to a hurting and broken world. Lord, help us to do that for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Yes, sir. Before we go. Oh, yeah. So does, that, does everybody remember, how many of you know Pastor Art that ran our seniors ministry? He was a missionary to China, just an incredible man who, he needs a book written about him. He's just such a faithful giant of the faith. He had an incident earlier and he has been taken to hospice and transferred to hospice. So uh, let's pray for him as well. Lord, I just thank you so much for Art. I thank you for his friendship. I thank you for what he's meant to your kingdom. Lord, I thank you that you, you give us great, wonderful men whose names might not be on billboards, but have humbly and faithfully served you and introduced you to so many people. Lord, I pray that you would be with him, that you would pour out your mercies upon him, that you would be with those, his loved ones that surround him, and that you would just overwhelm them with your presence, your peace, and that should you choose to call him home, and when you choose to call him home, Lord, that he would just delight to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, and that he would be mightily celebrated by a church that owes him a lot. And so we lift him up, Lord, I pray for comfort, for healing, if that would be your will. And um, I just give you thanks for that, man. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Have a great night, everyone.